So, in the realm of animals, uh, apparently, someone at some point decided that it was going to be a good idea to use a new animal for avalanche rescue systems. That animal was the Wolverine. And not the Hugh Jackman Wolverine. Not the Hugh Jackman Wolverine. Not the... Not that guy. I mean, I would be down if Hugh Jackman was to come and dig me out of an avalanche. I'd be like, holy shit, Hugh Jackman, can you sing for me? It'd be fucking phenomenal. Yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. The no, singing part, mostly. No, uh, Mike Miller, um, this guy, he was... <laughs> the quotes out of this article are so great. <laughs> I love this. This is the one that sums up this idea. New ideas normally do sound ridiculous. Which, realistically, ridiculous ideas just sound ridiculous. Ridiculous. Could you imagine having wolverines Dude. on the mountain? Like th That's like a feral fucking creature that's yeah. just pissed off all the time. Yeah, and at one point he says, anything you can train a dog to do, you can train a wolverine to do five times quicker. Really? Are we sure about that? Have we tried to domesticate wolverines yet? Is that a thing? I don't feel like, like, like that's like a thing. Like in the 1920s, did they domesticate wolverines? Not these, that I'm aware you of. You know, has is, is there been any time in human <laughs> history where we're like, we're going to just domesticate the wolverine. It's going to be this new little fucking... I mean, this... Granted, since this article came out, he has rescinded his idea of wolverines to do this. But... Um, An another great quote. 100 years ago, people who suggested using dogs for avalanche victim search were thought to be crazy. Were they? Were, where's the proof on that quote? Because but, we've been using dogs as, like, team effort for things for thousands of years. Thousands. Well, yeah, we, we domesticated them from wolves. Long, long, long time it's ago. Okay. And they've been our hunting partners forever. Like, doesn't that seem like a pretty easy correlation? Like, oh, they're good at finding things. I'm just going Better fox hunting with are. my Wolverine today. Yeah, yeah, that's never happened. So, I don't, I, I, feel, I feel like this guy just was like, hey, this would be crazy. And then he just decided to try and actually make it happen. I feel like this man's from Florida. Not like, at, like, like yeah. this story, this story should start a Florida man. 100%. Has domesticated a uh, wolverine to be an avalanche rescue animal. Which is funny because today something popped up from Stevens Pass and uh, uh, Washington Department of Transportation. And they had they have a fucking rescue goat. And I was like, oh my god. And I think it's like a little pygmy fainting goat. I mean, they're very agile. Yeah, they, well, they're so, nimble and they can climb on things. Yeah. But how funny would it be to get rescued by a pygmy goat and be like, ah! And he just like freaks out and passes out and just like goes stiff. But... I, I'd, be, I'd rather be rescued by a goat than a wolverine. 100%. Like, like, I don't I don't get... Where do you get the fucking idea that a wolverine would be a good thing? Apparently they have a great sense of humor. Yeah? <laughs> do they? Yeah, that's what Steve Kroeschel says. He's been raising wolverines for 35 years. And I want to see how many how many scars this man has on Agreed. Him. You know, it's like that guy that's like, oh yeah, my best friend's a full-size grizzly bear. And then, you know, three years later, you hear he got killed by the grizzly bear in Eden. No, no, no. It's like that guy that lives in Montana that's got the, the pet grizzly bear or brown bear or whatever it is. And he's like, yeah, whenever I take him to the vet, man, it's it's an adventure. He's in there pulling knobs and stuff and ripping the seat apart. And I'm like hitting him and driving and people are looking at me and I'm like beating him with a newspaper. Like, stop it. Stop it. And there's like this bear in there. And I'm like, I, certain animals you just don't domesticate. No. Like. He just Wolverines. I I want I want to just be there like when this guy is proposing this like yeah okay guys so I got this Wolverine it can dig really fast I've been training him he's not feral at all he's fine and I could just see that thing like digging down finding a human and being like that time to eat him right you know like they're a very angry little animal they're very very angry. I love this. This quote's the best. They're loyal. Once they know you well, it sticks. They're kind to you. Yes, because you're feeding them. But to what about you? you? <laughs> like, what are you? What are you going to do? Oh, oh man. Oh. <laughs> I'm just so lost right now. I just love that he had to say this. I hope your readers understand that we are professional and serious. The fact that you had to say that out loud, that should say something. 
Does this guy? Do you think this guy would leave his child alone with a Wolverine? That's a great question. Like, I really want to be like, dude, do you trust it alone with your small child? Like, little kids pulling on it and shit just comes back and there's just, like, stumps laying there and he's dead. Oh, my gosh. You know, like... There's just... I, I just... Like, I just don't get this. And I, I love this. Positive reinforcement in the form of snacks for good behavior. They could be up and running in a few years' time. So you're, you're like, it's just... Good Wolverine is... I mean, I get it. If you got it as, as a baby, it doesn't really... You could probably stop it from any of its tendencies, but at the same time, Siegfried and Roy, man, those white lions. Exactly. And they got fucking mauled. Yeah, it specifically says that part of the reason he thought this was going to be a great idea was because Wolverines naturally patrol avalanche lines looking for basically dead animals or trapped animals in order to dig them up and eat them. So, yes, they are naturally designed to find things 20 or so feet under the snow, but it's to eat them. So... Like, why? I mean... This poses I, more questions. I'm going to have a real emotional roller coaster if I ever get caught in avalanche, and then suddenly light starts to pop for it through, but then something starts eating my face. Like that's gonna be a real roller coaster of emotions, and I don't know if don't I don't worry, that. Kevin. I've been training tarantulas to dig you out. That's not gonna work. Avalanche spiders, man. It's not gonna happen. It is. Can we just stop talking about that in general? Kevin doesn't like spiders. Not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want Wolverine eating my face. Thanks, though. <sighs> but that that does go into the next topic because. Uh, We've had, since the start of the season, there's been a bunch of inbounds deaths due to avalanches in Europe and North America. Yep. Most notably, the most recent one was up at Silver Mountain in Idaho. And this begs the question of, are we going to have to start wearing transceivers inbounds? I think, so I actually just had a conversation with our Arbor rep, and he was talking about, he had a bomb and day up at Big Sky a couple of years ago, but it was at a specific zone that they, A, only let a certain amount of people ride a day, period. And B, you had to have AVI gear, full AVI setup gear, and it was in bounds. So, you know, I think it's kind of a hard situation to figure out as far as what terrain you require that for, what terrain you don't. But I absolutely don't see a problem with that whatsoever. I think depending on the terrain and depending on the mountain, all those kind of factors, I don't see a problem with it. I think it makes sense to a certain degree. It's just going to keep people from doing something stupid. And it saves that kind of terrain for people that can actually make the best of it. Well, it takes me back to that epic skier flip out at Big Sky. I think it was Big Sky. Maybe it was one lighter. One of, one of the ones in Montana where the guy was losing his shit because he bought a lift ticket and he went to get on the chair and they wouldn't let him on because he didn't have a beacon because they, they say that you have to. Mm -hmm. And his, his tantrum, like it made it everywhere all over the internet. I and mean, that was probably like four or five years ago. Um, but I, I I don't see a problem with it. I mean, it's just you need to build the awareness of people and stuff. Right. But that begs the question, if I show up with my emotional support, Wolverine, does it have to wear a transceiver? Yes. Oh. Man, he's already angry. But I it, it you know, the other thing is, why are we having... Like, I've seen people pose this question. Why are we having... Avalanches in bounds, they're supposed to mitigate it, but at the same time, you're in unknown tra um, right. conditions. Like Breckenridge has had an inbound avalanche, mm -hmm. uh, Copper has had them. Um, and your ski patrol does their best, but they're not perfect. Right. There's only so much you can do. There's still right. other factors that can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people have died at Vale over the last few years ducking a rope in bounds and something right. slides? Like, I set. I set a small slab off the other day at the basin. It was just, it was, you could, t I, when I got there, I realized I was like, oh, it was really windy and it was like blowing uphill and everything was so loaded and it was inbounds and I just came down and it, w it was flat as shit. Like it only slid like four feet. It wasn't enough to do anything to me, but it was like the second it cracked, I was like, oh, oh, no wonder the backside and the beavers is closed. And, uh, yeah, it's, I don't, you know, like I said, I don't really have a problem with this per se, I think it's something that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's one of those things that, like, when we really think about it, it would make things a little safer. And maybe it just becomes, like, certain sections of the mountain, it just becomes known, like, if you're going to go in there, you've got to have a transceiver, you got to have a shovel, you got to have a probe. Yeah. But then it also begs the, the question of, will these people actually get you learn how to use it or they're just going to have it on them and then you're just using it to find their body like right you, you know i was at steamboat this weekend and they have their little uh transceiver terrain park where you can go up and like check mm -hmm. and do it me mm -hmm. mason does that with the uh beacon bash or beacon bowl or whatever they call it yeah and i i don't know i i think well what well i guess so my answer to that would be you have i mean we've basically done this exact thing with terrain parks in the True. Past. Different mountains have done that. Winter Park did that, where you couldn't get into dark territory until you took a class. Yeah, but their park was shit. I, I'm not saying it was <laughs> warranted. It was smaller than right. than Freeway at Breck, but the, the, the precedent has been set for that, where if you want to be able to go ride that terrain, then you just have automated ticket scanners or you have scanners at that lift, and your pass has to be... You know, everybody's doing electronic passes nowadays for most of the major resorts anyway. So right. you just have to, you have to go take a class. You have to pass a class on Abbey safety. And until you do, your pass doesn't work for that terrain, period. And yeah. you also have to have the gear to get there. It's essentially like taking the swim test to get in the deep end. Right. Yeah, same, same Which isn't concept. Bad. Yeah. It's, it's not a bad concept and, at And all. people will bitch that like, oh, I'm paying for the mountain that, you know, I used to be able to ride that terrain and now I have to do all this extra stuff to ride that terrain. I didn't have to. And unless I do all this extra stuff and I have a whole section of money basically that I can't use. But when it comes down to safety and the other thing is, is this could save your life because what happens if something happens to you, then suddenly you're benefiting from the fact that everybody that's riding that terrain knows what to do, or at least has a vague understanding of what to do. They've been told at least once what to do well it also and that could save your life it so. also comes down to making sure that everyone knows once the avalanche has happened to switch their beacon over to the find mode otherwise yeah. they're, they're sending off the positive exactly that so it could be there and i'm i'm not a backcountry guy by any means neither am i like, i barely uh, know much I, 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 I just gave away my split board and shit i was like i'm fucking over it i'm like i'm never gonna do this i like to ride flying couches um and i i honestly like if i was at a resort and they just told me that Hey, you have to have this for here. I'd be like, is the train worth it? And if they were just straightforward with me and be like, yeah, I'd be like, where's your beacon rental or whatever. I'd go run it and be like, yep, yeah, okay, this is fine. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have too much of a problem with it, but I can see where like the casual person that maybe goes five, 10 days a year would probably lose their fucking shit because they're like, I only have so much time to be out here for someone like me. I'd be like, eh. All right, whatever. I don't care. I only ride four hours a day, anyways. If you only have so much time and you're that angry about it, I don't want you in that terrain. No, they're a liability. Exactly, and that's the thing is somebody that doesn't know what they're doing in terrain that has the capability of sliding in bounds and not a, not necessarily a freak slide, but like a legitimate risk of it, then you could set something off. You could, and you could set something off above someone, and suddenly you just killed somebody. Which makes me wonder, would you get charged with involuntary manslaughter? Potentially. I like, I mean, if you were, let's right. say. Right, if that terrain required that kind of knowledge and education and, and you they had some sort it. of precedent for it and then you were back there without the proper, like if, like if you managed to get into that terrain and it required, you have to take the class in order for your pass to work back there and you got back there without the class. Yeah, I could easily see that being an issue. Well, the first case would be the one that sets the precedence. So right, right now there's probably nothing. Yeah, right now I can't imagine there is because you're taking the same risk as everybody else because yeah. there's no separate precedent for that terrain specifically. But then I also wonder about resort insurance, if this would raise rates, which would raise ticket prices. Hmm. Because that's that's realistically like where one of the biggest costs is, the uh, insurance right. to carry it. So yeah. um, that makes it, – it, it's one of those things. It's like, yeah. it, it's like this perpetual gray area that you yeah. kind of have to – try to figure out what's going on with it and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I don't, I guess that acts, that poses more questions, but I mean, if there's anyone in our audience that's more backcountry savvy or is from Montana or was even up at silver Idaho or was over in Europe, uh, where these inbounds av avalanches happened and stuff, um, 
maybe they could shed some light on this in the comments section. Yeah. Also, who out there wants to get rescued by a wolverine? Yep. That's that's another that's another one that I really am not too sure about right there. 